And you I guys, I'll, I'll just have you guys introduce yourselves. Like, should Swale introduce me, and then I'll introduce you. I'll have the three of you introduce yourself after that. Right. Thank you, everyone, for joining Thank in. I see people are starting to sign in. Um, we will get started at one o'clock immediately, so we're just waiting for people to start signing in. Thank you. Thanks, Way. Great, you get started on time today. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today here at the National Center for Victims of Crime. My name is Host Boy Melendez. I'm the program manager for the Complex Homicide Program here at the National Center. Today's webinar is entitled Traumatic Grief Response Through the Lens of a Death Notification. Um, this project, this webinar is funded through OVC, through Office of Victims of Crime, Office of Justice Programs, and the U.S. Department of Justice. Today's presenter is Ms. Michelle Palmer. She is the executive director for the Wint Center for Lost in Hearing. Before we continue, I do want to give some house rules. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a Q&A. In the Q&A is where we ask you all to write down your questions. We will have 15 minutes at the end of the webinar to answer all of the questions. We'll, we won't answer them throughout the webinar, but we will at the end. And if you have any technical difficulties, please write it in the chat section. And without further ado, I'll leave it to you, Michelle. All right, thanks, Sway. Hi, as Sway said, I'm Michelle Palmer. Uh, I'm the executive director of the WEN Center for Loss and Healing, which is a mental health agency in the District of Columbia that specializes in grief, loss, and trauma. Um, today, I have uh, some friends with me from West Palm Beach, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So we'll start with Maura. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Maura Smith. I am the DUI Homicide Project Coordinator for Palm Beach County Victim Services. My name is uh, Investigator Sean Ramsey. I work for the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office as a traffic homicide investigator. Good afternoon. My name is Scott Levy. I work at Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. I am also a traffic homicide investigator. Thanks. All right. So as we said, um, I am going to talk today about traumatic grief and traumatic loss, and we are going to use real life examples of death notifications to help illustrate um, and give sort of a real life context to what we're talking about. Um, I have <clears throat> done training on death notification for about I think three years now. Um, I find it a particularly helpful framework um, because it is one of the most pure and raw experiences that people can have. Um, and I think it helps folks understand what can be sort of an academic idea and um, brings it into sort of a real life context. What I wanna do is first talk about terms so that we are all using the same language. Um, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but what I do wanna make sure um, that I say is grief, what I want you to focus on here is that grief is an actual process. It is actually not an experience. It is not the death notification. Um, it is the process that happens after the death notification. Um, and then mourning is really sort of how we display that grief and 
Um, before we got on this webinar, uh, myself and the panelists were talking about really how culture in, can and does actually inform folks' behavior specifically around um, a death notification. And we are going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, I also want to uh, say that while yes, we're talking about this in sort of a professional context, um, grief and loss and traumatic grief and trauma and death notification um, are also incredibly personal for most people, um, if not all people, uh, relationships have a shelf life. Um, they are going to end at some point, either through death, through separation, voluntarily, involuntarily, and depending on our relationship to that relationship, we are going to grieve. And how we grieve will vary. It will vary based on our personality. It will vary based on what's happening in our lives based on the support we have, based on our culture. Um, but so what I want you to do and think about today is yes, this is a professional webinar, but I also hope that what you'll also get out of this is some information that you can use in, in your real life if and when um, you do have to experience this or you have to support somebody who's navigating this. Um, just really quickly, lost. We're not gonna get into a ton of this other than secondary losses and I'm actually gonna, which tend to be psychosocial losses and I'm gonna talk more about that as we move through it. All right, there are actually several models out there around grief. The one that the WEN Center uses is Warden's Four Tasks of Grief or Mourning. Um, I like this, we use this, um, not because it's linear. It is not actually intended to be linear. It's not like, okay, I'm gonna accept the reality. I'm gonna work through the pain. I'm gonna emotionally relocate that person. We tend to come in and out of this because human beings are variable. Um, but what I think is really um, important, the most really important thing about this slide is to know that actually moving through grief actually takes work. Um, we had a, I had a woman at the WEN Center, this is a few years ago. She's a client, she's not a client of mine, but she's a client of the WEN Center. And we were in the kitchen and I just said, oh, how are you? And she said, well, you know, I'm here, I'm not doing that good. Um, which I was like, fair point. Um, but uh, she said, you know, my mom died nine years ago and you'd think I'd be over it by now, but I'm not. Um, and really one of the things that I think is so important to know is there is this, this saying that um, time heals all wounds. In the context of grief and loss, the only thing that time does is pass. If you don't actually do some things to help yourself heal from a significant loss, the only thing time is gonna do is pass. It's not gonna make it better. It may blunt the pain, um, but it will not actually ameliorate the pain. The healing won't happen. Um, and so I like this model because it talks about tasks, which, which in, involves activity, movement. You actually have to do something. Um, I think any of us, probably most people on this webinar, have experienced a significant loss in our life. Um, and whether you were intentional or not, you did things to help yourself heal and feel better from that experience. Because none of us, it's, it's not actually human behavior to want to stay unhappy. Um, all right. There's a lot of different kinds of grief. Um, I'm gonna talk about traumatic grief in a minute, but I wanna talk for a second about normative grief. Normative grief 
is something that most of us have. It is what most of us experience. It is somebody that I loved died. And I have enough of a support network that I'm never going to come to the attention of a mental health professional because my friends, my family are going to love on me enough that I'm going to get the support I need. The exception to that is either cause of death or relationship. So for instance, we rarely see somebody walk through the doors of the One Center who have what we would call a normative grief experience. Their grandparent died, uh, they were close to them, they loved them, they're grieving, but they don't need a mental health professional to help navigate that. What we more typically see are folks who are navigating either disenfranchised grief or traumatic grief and loss. Um, and that is the nature of the loss, the nature of the relationship has made this bereavement experience so acute and challenging that my loved ones, my friends and my family, as much love as they give me, cannot help me navigate this. Um, in a mental health world, uh, we know that that is true around traumatic loss because it is difficult to heal from trauma without some level of mental health intervention. Um, so traumatic loss can be super, often is super, super complicated um, because the bereaved person or people have the duality of having to navigate a bereavement experience as well as a traumatic experience. At the one center, we actually treat the trauma first. Um, and the reason for that is when we are navigating a trauma, um, our brain actually goes into fight, flight, and freeze. It doesn't matter if you are in the immediate experience of the trauma or afterwards, your brain doesn't actually distinguish. And when that happens, it, hi it hijacks the frontal part of your brain, which is where we process information, where we make decisions. And so for us to be able to process information, including emotions, we need that frontal part of our brain to actually work. And so to get, the, to get access to the frontal part of that brain, we treat the trauma first. Once that trauma gets treated, it gives people this, literally the space in their brain that they need to be able to process the emotions of the loss, of the death. Um, traumatic loss has some key components to it that make it a trauma. Not all of these things need, need to be present and frankly, most times are not all present for a traumatic loss, but components of a traumatic loss include that it's sudden or unanticipated. Um, typically that it involves some level of violence or injury to the decedent. Um, that it is seen as random um, or preventable. Um, sometimes there's multiple decedents. Um, and oftentimes it is, uh, it complicates a bereavement experience when family members happen upon, either they discover the body, which happens uh, not infrequent, infrequently with suicide, or they happen upon on the body. Um, do we want to talk, Sean, do you want to talk about um, any of the notifications that you've done where there is family at the scene? I mean, I've, had, I've had a handful of them. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it's close to home. You know, like the collision will be, the crash site will be like a block away from their house or whatever it may be. And sometimes they hear about it from a neighbor or they look at the time and it's been a couple hours. So they go looking. Um, in those cases, we do our best to get them to go home. So that way it'll give us more time to finish up on scene and I'm not always looking over my shoulder to see what they're doing and if they're okay. Um, them, 
the possibility of them running out into traffic is real, especially if they're trying to evade deputies that are not allowing them to go where they want to go. Um, so we encourage them to go home. And if they refuse, a lot of times we'll just find a safe spot for them to sit down, we have them stay there, we put a deputy on them, they wait, and we'll, we'll get back to them when we can. Um, it's, it's obviously not an ideal situation. If, it, if it's avoidable, you do your best. It's about, I mean, that's about all we could, you could really do with that kind of stuff. Um, notifications on scene usually don't go well because they're obviously very much aware of what's already happened. And at that point, they've had time to think about it. And either they'll be super upset or they'll be angry because of what happened. Thank you. Scott, did you have anything you wanted to add? No. Okay. Um, the other piece that I want to talk about specifically around traumatic loss is trauma embeds itself in our senses, which means that we can be triggered through our senses, um, which is difficult because, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't have a whole lot of control over what smells are in the environment or what I might hear. So I live in a neighborhood of Washington, D.C., where um, it is not uncommon to hear gunshots. Um, in fact, last night I heard some. <laughs> but um, if I were mourning the death of somebody who died as a result of a gunshot wound, that sound might trigger me. That sound might create what really are PTSD symptoms, either flashbacks, intrusive thoughts, sort of intrusive thoughts are like that hamster wheel of thoughts that you have in your head that you can't seem to interrupt or stop. Um, nightmares are another one. Um, and so traumatic loss can be tricky uh, because Again, it's the duality of the trauma and all of the complications that come with that trauma, as well as the grief. And remember, we were talking about sort of, you know, grief is work. To navigate grief, one actually needs to do something. Um, so let me just, I want to make sure I'm hitting all of the things that I wanted to. Yeah, I think so. All right. So there are some considerations that are, again, very specific to traumatic loss. Um, <clears throat> traumatic death actually lives longer in one's memory than what we would call a normative loss. Um, it is oftentimes, the, the memory is oftentimes more associated with what happened to the body and the cause of death versus who the person was who died. Um, oftentimes, who the person was who died is overshadowed by how they died. Um, and oftentimes, bereaved folks um, who are navigating a traumatic loss will be unable to separate out the person that died versus how they died, and they tend to focus on how they died. And so, one of the work, sort of part of the work of bereaved people, but also grief therapists, I think victim advocates, is also to help people understand that their loved one is far more than the way in which they died. Um, that can be really tricky and it gets complicated with high profile uh, deaths. So if, if it is um, something that it happens and it's newsworthy and the news, it's, you know, on a news feed and, you know, news likes that hog, sort of the sensational bits of it. And so they, the news tends to focus not on who the person was who died, but on how they died. Um, and I think George Floyd is a really good example of that. I think most Americans know 
what that man's cause of death was rather than who he was. Um, and I have heard his family um, really starting to try and make a very public effort to share with people that he was more than the way he died, that he was somebody who had a daughter and, you know, who, you know, loved music. Um, and so it's, it's, it can be very helpful for bereaved folks to have that redirection, to have us help them see their person as more than just that cause of death. Um, the, other, the other sort of piece that I think is really important on this particular slide is this last piece. So there are, um, there is a school of thought that there are two different kinds of grievers. There are intuitive grievers and there are instrumental grievers. And most of us are a little bit of both and sort of fall along that line. Intuitive grievers tend to be more emotive. Um, they tend to be emotional grievers. It does actually fall oftentimes on gender lines, but that's because grief is cultural and we, we enculturate women to be more emotive. So women tend to demonstrate more instrumental grieving or sorry, more intuitive grieving. Whereas the other sort of end of that is instrumental grievers. And instrumental grievers are those people who need to see something happen, who need to be active around the loss. Um, so a great, great example of um, an instrumental griever is John Walsh. Um, you are most of many of you probably too young to remember uh, Adam Walsh was a young boy actually in Florida um, who was kidnapped and murdered. Um, his father, in response to that, started the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, John Walsh is very much an instrumental griever. He needed his child's loss to have meaningful impact in the world. A, a smaller scale of that is instrumental grievers who will do sort of a, go a golf tournament in honor of, and it's an annual thing and it's typically a fundraiser and it goes to a particular charity. That is an instrumental griever. Again, most of us are both and we fall along some sort of a continuum on that. For instrumental grievers, uh, the one bit of caution is that if you are an instrumental griever or if you uh, are supporting folks who sort of fall along the lines of instrumental grievers, it can be easy to use that focus to avoid the actual feelings. Um, and so, you know, you see somebody who gets uh, very, very invested in, uh, we have actually a family here in DC, their, their son was uh, killed um, by a stray bullet. So they're very now invested in, in um, gun laws and, and reform. Um, and I actually said to this young man's father not long ago, be careful that that's not the only thing that you're focusing on because whether you want to manage it or not, the feelings are still there and they're not going anywhere unless you kind of address it and face it. Um, and you can do both. You can have all the feels and you can change the laws or plan something. Um, but what, what we see at the WEN Center oftentimes is instrumental grievers also kind of try and outrun the grief, like I'm going to do X, Y, and Z so as not to actually have to sit in it and feel it. I will also tell you that it is not uncommon for married couples to grieve almost in opposite ways. And, you know, when you hear the statistics around, you know, uh, parents who have navigated the death of a child that the divorce rate for those parents is very, very high. 
my professional experience and sort of best guess is that that is partially because they have not found the common ground around the way they're grieving. And so, you know, I want you to grieve the way I grieve so that I can feel less alone in that grief. Um, and the spouse feels the same exact way and they can't find that middle ground. Um, and then, you know, and, and, and so it starts to get difficult and things start to come up, resentments start to build. Um, you know, I'm gonna try and change you. No, I'm gonna try and change you. When we actually just recognize that, ah, okay, your grief, just the way you manage your grief is different from than mine. It's not better, it's not worse, it's just different. And hey, let's agree to not try and change each other, but let's find common language around it. And I will tell you at the One Center, when we do couples work, that is the most frequent thing that we do with couples is trying to help them find that middle ground and that common language so that they're not feeling so alone in their grief. Grief is an incredibly isolating experience. Um, and so, you know, <clears throat> when you're trying to navigate it with a partner who's doing it very differently than you, it actually can even feel more isolating. And so really trying to step back and say, you know what, I wanna try and understand. I don't wanna try and change. I just wanna try and understand and come together to have a shared language so that we can do this together rather than pulling each other further apart. Um, it is not uncommon and I'm sure um, everyone who has ever done actually um, either a death notification or navigated helped navigate somebody through a grief, a significant grief experience. For people who are acutely bereaved truly feel that they will never, ever, ever feel better again. That there's simply not a possibility that they will find joy again, that they will find happiness again, that they will ever smile again. Um, and so, you know, as you're thinking about either how do I manage a personal grief experience or how do I help somebody I care about navigate a grief experience or through my job, what is it that I can do to help victims navigate their grief experience is to not try and tell them that it's gonna be better. That is not going to convince them. All of the evidence in the world is not going to convince them. So it really is around validating, you know what, I get that. I can't imagine how difficult this must be for you. I get that it feels like you are never, ever gonna feel better. Um, what I do sometimes say to people is, um, and I'm gonna walk you with you right next to you um, and maybe to a point where you feel better and maybe not. Um, and you will do this. This is what grief is. It is like the most unfun roller coaster on the planet. If you think roller coasters are fun, they are not my jam. But um, the grief roller coaster is some moments you feel better and some moments you feel like you're never gonna get out of bed and you're never gonna be able to take a deep breath again and you're never gonna be able to eat because your sadness is all the way up to your chin. Um, and it's really helping people understand that that's actually normal. I think as a, um, as a grief therapist, the thing I say the most commonly or most frequently, especially at the morgue, is you are not crazy. Um, because acute grief impacts so many things, it really does make one feel like they're going crazy. Um, the, the other thing I just wanna highlight on this slide is um, helping folks understand that this might get worse before it gets better. I'm not saying actually say that. Um, because if you already feel terrible, somebody telling you, oh, well, this is gonna get worse before it gets better, not helpful. Um, 
But for, for us to understand that actually getting worse does not mean that that person um, is, is in trouble, is suicidal, is any of the things. It actually is just grief is not linear. Um, and so it's complicated and we take one step forward and two steps back. My, my, uh, my mom is an identical twin um, and her identical twin died of breast cancer. And as you might imagine, it was devastating. My mom and my aunt had my cousin Craig and I six hours apart in the same hospital. That's how close they were. Um, and she was so devastated um, that we were really afraid he was gonna die. Um, and so what, what my family kind of, what we ended up doing is this shorthand, instead of checking in with my mom every day and having a heavy, deep and real like, how are you today, mom? She finally was like, stop asking me like that. You're making me crazy. You're making me feel worse. I will let you know if it's a good day or not a good day. And what we found through that is for my mom, a good day at the beginning meant she got out of bed. That's, that was a good day for my mom. A bad day was not getting out of bed, not eating, not being able to stop crying, not being able to be consoled. And it went back and forth like that for probably a year Certainly not as acutely. She got out of bed more often than she didn't. Um, we were able to console her more, more often than we weren't. But it certainly wasn't always, it wasn't like she started to feel better and she continued to feel better and that was her trajectory. It wasn't that. It was back and forth and fits and starts. And that is actually very, very common. Um, and so the other thing to know, both as law enforcement victim advocate, friend, family member, is you kind of got to be in it for the long haul. Um, and you got to pace yourself because it does go back and forth and it can be exhausting if you're the person or one of the people who's trying to support somebody who's navigating this traumatic loss. Um, the other thing I often say that um, I I am a therapist who does not believe that everybody needs therapy. I actually believe that most people can navigate most things without a therapist. Traumatic loss, unfortunately, is not one of those things. Most people do need some level of counseling to begin to be able to heal. And that is not because of bereavement. That's because of the trauma associated with the loss. Um, all right, I'm going to do uh, secondary losses and then um, I'm going to uh, ask these guys to chime in around some death notifications, both sort of, I, I asked them to think about like some of the more extreme examples so that we can really dive in and sort of see like, oh, that's what that looks like. That's what, you know, an emotional response or non-emotional response looks like. That's what trauma looks like. Um, what is hard really around many losses, secondary losses are not specific to traumatic grief, um, but they are, at, they can be as difficult because they make a complicated situation more complicated. So loss of financial support um, or a fear of loss of financial support. If it is your loved one who was the breadwinner who died and you don't have any work experience, that is going to complicate this bereavement because you actually don't have the luxury to just grieve. You're also worried about how am I gonna pay the rent? How am I gonna pay the electric bill? Um, loss of the relationship, that's obvious. Sometimes loss of the support system, um, you know, if, if, you know, my, my, my brother is um, engaged and, you know, God forbid, if, if anything happened to him, I'm not 100% sure that we'd stay 
involved or engaged with his fiance. Um, and we, I think, are a pretty big support system for she and her son. So it, you know, we're not terrible people, but we just don't have sort of that emotional connection. Um, and so really a loss of support system can be really difficult. Obviously possessions, um, hopes and dreams, if that is particularly true when a kid dies or a young person. Um, the one that's not on here that I also think is important is sort of loss of identity. Um, if a parent, if the ch only child of a parent dies, is that person still a parent? I've had many parents ask me that, like, do I still introduce myself as a parent because I don't have a child anymore? Um, my mom is an identical twin. I never know, do I say she was an identical twin or she is an identical twin? For her, that's a really important identity. Um, and so not knowing sort of who you are and losing your identity, even for a short time, can be very, very challenging. It can be very, very scary. Um, so, all right, secondary losses. And Maura's going to talk about, especially for as victim advocates, I'm not sure how many victim advocates I have on this webinar, but um, this is actually some of the things that you can help mitigate. Um, particularly around finances, possessions, things like that. All right, so I'm gonna hand this over um, to Sean and Scott, uh, and they're gonna talk about um, a couple of the notifications that they've done around sort of unexpected, sudden, violent death. So I will let you guys decide who's gonna go first. Sean, you wanna go ahead? Can you give us a I guess maybe a little better, I guess maybe example of what you're hoping for or um, maybe you narrow it down a little bit. Yeah, so That's talk about what, topic. So what we talked about earlier. So talk about that death notification where, you know, there was a really significant emotional response where you were kind of like, that was big. Um, and also I think it would be helpful to do the opposite where it was really kind of a buttoned up response that you kind of were left wondering how this person was going to navigate? Um, I think overall, you're, you're, you're apt to get varied reactions across the board. There's really no rhyme or reason to it sometimes. Um, I've had them do basically everything from standing there silent to screaming, crying, throwing themselves on the floor, rolling around, I've tried to have them hit me, grab me, hug me, shove me out the front door. I've had them turn and start punching holes in walls. We've had them, members of my unit have had them turn around into a kitchen, grab a butcher knife and come at us. Um, there is no real way to predict the way these people are gonna behave. The only thing you can do is kind of formulate in your mind a plan as to what you're not gonna allow them to i.e. never let them out of your sight. Don't allow them to move too far away from you. Don't allow them to shut the door in your face and go in the house. Um, don't allow them to go to their bedroom unattended. It's awkward, follow them in. You're doing it for a reason because you don't know what they're going for. They could be going for a phone or a gun to kill themselves. You don't know and we've had it happen. Um, you know, so, and that's, there's another reasoning why we take some of the steps that we take you take a good look at some of the people we deal with, I try, to, I try to learn as much about them as I can before I get there. So if I learn that so-and-so's mother, you know, happens to be 70 years old, she's in hospice care, dialysis, and all these other medical issues, I'm gonna have EMS with me when I get there. So that when I tell her, hey, your son's dead, she doesn't drop dead right on me right there. It happens, it has happened, and if you're not prepared for it, it'll happen to you. Um, further from that is we always try to do a notification with two of us. I've done them with single, it's never a good idea. Um, if you come up into someone's home and you're not prepared, if they do something that where you're 
you know, it's out of your control or they start running around their house, smashing things or doing whatever, or if they, or if they do something completely inappropriate for you, i.e. they start tearing clothes off and throwing and rolling around on the floor, it puts you in a pretty bad spot if you're alone, especially if you don't have any other, any other witnesses there. Okay. Thank you. Scott? A lot of what Sean said is correct. Um, we can try to go with what uh, each gender will do, what each religion will, will likely do, but you never really know until you're walking up to the steps and you're making contact with, with the family to do the notifications. So some of the things that, um, that my law enforcement does and some of the best practices include a, actually a lot of what um, Sean was talking about, which is, you know, get as much information as you can ahead of time. Has law enforcement responded to this residence before? What was the nature of the calls that they responded to? It helps you understand maybe who's gonna be in the house, what the scenario is, are there guns in the house or not? Are there drugs in the house or not? Um, it is challenging, um, but you do actually wanna try and get in that house. People have a hundred million reasons why they don't wanna let law enforcement in the door. Um, it is not ideal um, and is not considered best practice to actually do the death notification on a, sort of in the doorway on a front step. Um, you can be, you can do as much as you can. You can charm, you can cajole. Um, but at the end of the day, if they're not gonna let you in, you've got a job to do, you need to do the notification. Um, one of, one of, the, um, one of my, my favorite stories that I tell is, um, uh, two law enforcement officers came, went to do a notification um, and they knocked on the door and the woman opened the door and saw that it was law enforcement and she quickly closed the door and apparently she ran upstairs It was um, and opened the window and she's like yelling out the window to, the, to law enforcement, what do you want? And law enforcement's like, we need to talk to you, you need to let us in. She's not gonna let him in, she's not gonna let him in, she's not gonna let him in. Finally, they ended up literally having to yell the death notification up at this lady from the second floor because she, for whatever reason, was not letting them into this house. Um, and, you know, as Sean said, the reason for that, the reason that you don't want to have that happen is because you can't control the scene. Um, and so you know you have absolutely no idea what this person is going to do, and if you are not in the space with them, you can't protect them. And frankly, you you have a less chance of protecting yourself because you don't um, you can't see what's happening and what's going on. Um, and so, also sort of to Sean's point, you know, doing it in dyads is considered best practice, it is not always possible. Um, if you are able to do it in twos, decide ahead of time who's gonna do what. So who's actually gonna say the word so-and-so died and who's gonna be the eye scanning for, you know, are there kids around? We wanna make sure that kids are out of earshot. Um, it is incredibly frightening for kids to see their caregivers become unhinged. Um, and so you wanna try and protect kids from that. Um, you know, are there other people in the house and what are they doing? Um, it is, you know, social media is, is unbelievably complicates things around homicide. Um, it is not at all uncommon for the family members to see a photograph of the decedent at the scene. Um, and it is all over social media. In DC, it is actually, and this is probably true for lots of jurisdictions, social media is where the beefs either start or they get worse and they get elevated. And part of the way that they get elevated is 
through photographs of decedents. Um, and so you've got family members who have access to photographs that they shouldn't have access to. Um, and so you're rolling up and they've already seen something. Um, and so it's also, unfortunately, then you've got the complication of how do you also help kind of calm that situation down. Um, in DC, we also have um, a program uh, that involves violence interrupters. This is specifically around gang and crew violence um, to try and mitigate any sort of retaliatory homicides that are gonna happen and so often um, the, the violence interrupters will actually accompany law enforcement when they know that they're going to do a notification to a house that is gang or crew affiliated. Um, so there's lots of reasons to kind of be able to, to know that, to try and get a lay of the land and try and get into that space before you do that notification. Um, the other piece that I'll say, um, that's probably self-evident, um, but to the extent possible, you want people to sit down before you deliver this news. Um, it is not uncommon uh, for people to faint when they learn something so um, sort of unexpected. And so you wanna mitigate the physical injury that can happen to that person by having them sit down. Oftentimes I try and, I bring water with me. Um, it is, uh, a, it's helpful because people get very dehydrated, shock dehydrated too immediately. Um, and so giving folks water is helpful, but it also helps regulate people's breath, which helps people calm down a little bit. So I'm also a big fan of water. Um, and you, you know, just a tiny little bottle is all that you need. Um, thank you guys. All right, so disenfranchised grief. Um, disenfranchised grief is actually also known as invisible grief or the grief that has no voice. Um, it is a kind of grief where either the loss isn't publicly recognized, um, that the, the mourner, the person grieving isn't recognized, um, that the relationship isn't recognized. I'm gonna talk a little bit, of, I'm gonna give you um, some examples of disenfranchised grief in a minute. Um, it is, it is disenfranchised grief is tricky. Um, the, it, it comes up in the context of this webinar, typically um, when somebody dies um, during the commission of a crime. So uh, if somebody dies while they're drinking and driving and they've killed somebody else, um, the person who was drinking and driving their family may experience disenfranchised grief. Um, uh, another easy example of disenfranchised grief is, um, so in DC, we had the Navy Yard shooting six and a half years ago. Um, Aaron Alexis was the shooter. His parents lived in New York. Um, and we were, I was with the families of all the, of the decedents the day after the, sh I was with them the day of the shooting. I was with them the day after the shooting and something pretty remarkable happened. They, uh, after a very contentious meeting with the Navy and the FBI, um, the families kind of poured out of this meeting space and gathered together and um, they actually started talking about, they looked around at each other and all of the support that they had, um, and they actually asked about his parents. Um, they recognized that they were, you know, they were up in New York grieving the death of a son. Um, was their grief going to be recognized? No, not in the same way that the decedent's grief, that the the victims of the shooting were, but they are no less his parents and they are no less grieving their son. Um, and so disenfranchised grief complicates grief because, you know, one of the ways that we grieve is culturally and we do it through rituals. 
Um, and when your loss is not recognized, you typically are not included in the ritual or there is not a ritual. COVID-19 created a ton of disenfranchised grief because people could not engage in their typical grief rituals. And so there wasn't a formal recognition of their loss. So here are just some examples um, of disenfranchised grief. My, um, so the first time I did this training, uh, I did it to uh, the homicide unit in, in the District of Columbia, because in DC, homicide does all of the death notifications, regardless of the cause of death. If it's a natural, they still do the notification. So anyway, um, we were talking about disenfranchised grief, and I was like, can anyone think of an example of disenfranchised grief? <laughs> and somebody says, yeah, like if your side piece dies. I am having absolutely no idea what a side piece is. I was like, I thought it was a gun. Um, and so I was like, what's a side piece? And then they explained to me what a side piece is. You know, your girlfriend who's not your wife or your boyfriend who's not your husband. Um, but I was like, oh, so that's my new phrase, side piece. Thank you, District of Columbia Homicide Unit. Um, but that is actually a good example of disenfranchised grief. Nobody's actually going to recognize that that person is grieving, either because they don't know about the relationship or because there's some judgment around the relationship. And so it really is around honoring and recognizing. And when you're navigating or supporting somebody who's, who's experiencing disenfranchised grief, the easiest thing to do is just validate, just validate their experience, understand. I, Sean said this earlier before the webinar started, that pain is pain. Um, it, and that, you know, nobody's pain is sort of better or worse or, you know, um, you know, that you have more of a right to it or not. Pain is pain. And so when somebody is experiencing disenfranchised grief, the best thing you can do is actually validate that that's their pain. All right, bereavement overload is really just like all of those secondary losses layered on top of an already um, difficult bereavement experience. Another one is if there's multiple deaths. So when COVID happened, um, there was a family in either New York or New Jersey, they had been at like a family reunion before this thing, before we knew the sort of magnitude of this thing. And I think nine, members of that family died over a week. Um, they all got COVID and they all, nine of them died of it. So that obviously is bereavement overload. That is navigating multiple losses or navigating a single loss that has multiple secondary losses associated with it. Um, so this is important um, because Bereaved people are incredibly vulnerable. Um, bereavement does impact our ability to regulate our emotions and our thoughts. Um, any of you may have heard of the phrase um, grief brain or grief fog. Um, it's kind of like where, where bereaved people are like trying to swim through pea soup in their brain. It was not at all uncommon at the morgue for me to ask family members, what's the date of birth of the decedent, and mothers not knowing their child's date of birth. It's not because they didn't know their child's date of birth. It's not because they didn't care about their child. It's because your short-term memory is impacted when you are acutely bereaved. This is also important um, for law enforcement, um, especially going through a court case. If you have a family who is navigating a court case and you need that family um, to either testify, be witnesses, um, whatever that may be, um, you need to, you need to, to the extent possible, make sure that they trust you, make sure that they feel heard by you, make sure that they feel understood by you, because they are far more likely to be better and cooperative witnesses than if 
they feel like this person does not care about my experience, what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. All right, um, so there's keys to working with victims, um, but Maura, do you wanna chime in and sort of talk about the victim advocate role in how to help support folks who are navigating either traumatic loss, disenfranchised loss, both, um, or just general co-victims of, of homicide? Sure. Um, I think the most important thing when working with, um, let's say, next of kin is um, to get to make contact with them as soon as possible, first of all, um, because when they see you up front immediately following the death of their loved one, um, you build that relationship right away. But with that being said, um, that uh, immediate engagement with them and then following up with them within 24 hours after your first contact, you start to develop that relationship with them, but it also helps to build trust with them. Um, so if, if, if after your first meeting with them, uh, you tell them, you know, I will give you a call tomorrow and check in with you, um, just following up on what you say you're going to do, I think helps them a lot. Um, we actually, when we respond out, we provide the next of kin with a survivor resource guide, which will have a lot of um, their answers to their questions that are typically asked right in that booklet. So when we first make contact with them, we don't need to spend a lot of time going over um, what to expect over the next few days. We can just briefly touch on, hey, this is what um, may be happening over the next 24 hours. You may get a call from our medical examiner's office. Uh, with some questions. Um, so after we do that, we can kind of just be there for them and not overwhelm them with information. Um, so after that first 24 hours, we will follow up with them and then they may have some questions prepared for us that we can discuss with them. Um, what we try to emphasize in our office is going out again and physically meeting with them in person instead of just a phone call. Um, we like to try to get out in the community and meet them where they're at um, to provide that in-person support. And again, that's just going to benefit them in the long run. Um, they're going to build that trust with you. They're going to have the rapport with you. Um, we try to help them understand that we are acting as a liaison between them and law enforcement, them and the prosecutor. Um, we want to make sure that whatever they want to see happen, now whether that can actually happen or not, but we want to make sure that their voice is heard as far as how they would like um, everything to proceed. Sometimes we have questions from next of kin about um, getting their loved one's belongings back from a crime scene or a um, vehicle crash. You know, they, they want their husband's wedding ring, they want his driver's license, something um, tangible to hold on to. So we let them know we will um, liaison with law enforcement to try to see what we can do, um, if it can be released from evidence at that time. Um, I think also just helping them understand that whatever they're feeling within those first few days is um, normal and common and helping them understand that, you know, they're going to have good days and bad days. And then helping them understand that, like Michelle said earlier, it's going to be almost like a roller coaster. They're going to have ups and downs. Um, different things are going to trigger them to, you know, have a really bad day. They may drive past the location of the crime scene. Um, they may smell something in the environment that reminds them of um, let's say they were in, um, they were actually at the crime scene and they had blood on them or they were also injured. So there might be a smell of like metal or anything that they taste that will remind them of blood or something like that. So we have, we've had a lot of next of kin mention things like that, um, that there's different trigger events. So what we also do in our office is we try to be prepared for those events and we'll reach out to them prior to that. Um, let's say that they have a big court hearing coming up the next day, our advocates will reach out to them a couple days beforehand, talk with them about that upcoming court date, what could happen, what may not happen. Um, if there's concerns they have and they want those relayed to the prosecutor, we will you know, assist with that. Um, we've also had some really cool um, restorative justice things occur where we've had families say, hey, I want to sit down and have a conversation with the suspect or the offender. So we'll go to the prosecutor and help arrange that so they can sit down in the same room as that person and have a conversation um, and usually ends up um, 
assisting with the criminal prosecution um, case also. So can go either way. Um, we also, as far as giving them some um, or empowering them, we provide them with as much information as we can and we let them guide us as far as what type of services they would like to accept or maybe they're not ready for therapy but we're just kind of listening to them and, and helping them understand like when you do feel you're ready we will get that linked for you um, sometimes they'll confide in us that they have children um, that they are going to have to gain custody of now because their adult daughter was killed so let's say they have three grand grandchildren and now they're going to have to um, navigate the whole family court system. So we'll assist them with that. We'll link them up to um, attorneys for the family court system. So just listening to what their immediate needs are and their immediate concerns are and linking them to as much services as we can, but we really try to take the load off of them. If we have to make phone calls for them and things like that, we will do that um, as best we can. But I think the top things to take away are you've got to build that report up front and you have to follow up when you say you're going to do something. You want to keep that trust and build that relationship. Um, and like Sean and um, Scott were saying earlier, you just have to give them the best information you can without overwhelming them at that first notification. Um, and then when they have follow-up questions, there'll be a time where you can arrange that with the investigator and the next of kin. Thanks, Nora. Sure. Um, Scott and Sean, can I ask you guys to talk about? Can you show me? Say that again, Sway? 15 minutes left. Okay, thanks. Um, Scott and Sean, can you guys talk briefly about how you answer the question, what happened? Um, I think that, that kind of depends on the case and the person that you're speaking with, uh, how in-depth they want you to be. But in general, especially if it's, if it's during a notification, um, I try to make my answers brief. I, I don't want to be too descriptive. If they Usually I'll sit down and I'll have two meetings with this person. You'll do your notification and you're probably going to meet up with them one other time, at least one other time if it's a non-criminal case. If it's a criminal, that's totally different. But for that first meeting, you're going to try to keep things pretty brief, but for that second meeting, they ask you to question what happened. I will warn them and I will say something very specific to if you ask me a direct question. I will give you a direct answer. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This is what happened. You may not like what I have to say. And from that moment on, that's it. You're going to, you're going to get exactly what happened. But I always, I try to warn them before I do that. Um, you know, and, and kind of going back to what you're talking about, for some of our criminal cases, um, they are going to have those questions. And one of the things that I'll say during the notification is, listen, you're going to have a lot of questions. And you're not going to remember them when you get me on the phone next time. So from here on out, I want you to carry, I want you to have a pen and paper next to you. Whenever these things pop in your head, I want you to write them down so that you have them ready. When you do have that next opportunity to speak with me, that way they're right there and you can just work your way right through everything and not get frozen just because you finally have me on the phone um, or in person. But further, getting into you know, a secondary meeting and something like that, a lot of times I'll sit down with the people at the next of kin for my, my criminal cases and that's kind of where I, I really give them the first rundown of what actually happened minus some, some of the details, but I am explaining to them the process, I'm explaining to them where things are going to go, how time, how, how long things are going to take, either a short amount of time or long. And from there, I, I, I try to introduce different tools that I may be able to bring to bear, like the victim's advocate, like the state attorney's office, and things like that. Um, sometimes they want to hear it, sometimes they don't. Um, I let them decide. And then on other occasions, and, Laura, and um, Warren knows this very this case very well. Other occasions, literally, I have to order them to speak to you. I literally show up at your house and I say, listen, you've become a hermit. 
sitting at your house for three months. Jackass, get up and answer the phone. She's coming here and you're going to talk to her. And he's like, no, I'm not. I said, yeah, you are. You're going to, you will. And after that, he was like, okay. You know, because, but, but sometimes they do that. It, they're just not ready to deal with it, maybe. I'm not sure. But um, as far as, as far as a law enforcement officer goes, that first interaction with us is, is very key, is, is key to developing kind of a relationship with everyone down the line, either the victim's advocate, the state attorney's office, any of these people that are going to reach out to them, if they get a bad taste in their mouth from us, it's going to carry on down the line. They're not going to like the victim's advocate. They're going to hate the state attorney's office. They're never going to be happy with the prosecution. I got the last one I had, I got 16 years, put the guy in jail, the woman still wasn't happy. So it doesn't, doesn't really matter sometimes. If, if, if they view you in that light, you're never going to be able to come away from it. A lot of times I'll also give uh, the victims my email, uh, the victim's family my email address. So that if they think of something in the middle of the night and they're not near a pen and paper, just shoot me an email. You know, I'll get back to them as quickly as I can with whatever answers that I have. Uh, and like Sean was saying, the first time that you make contact with them is extremely important for them to sort of bond with you, to understand that, that you have a job to do and you're there to explain it to the best that you can. And a lot of times the families appreciate that, you know, when we talk to them later on, hey, thank you for, for being there. Thank you for explaining it the way that you did and, and everything else. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say one other thing about this. We're running out of time. And um, I will also say though, we have probably all done this when somebody that you care about is grieving you it is very normal that we say oh my god i'm so sorry what can i do well that just you just made what you can do their problem they now have to figure out what you can do to help them <laughs> so it's much more helpful if you can say like depending on what the relationship is like i was thinking i could do x y or z so kind of give a menu that way they don't have to come up with something and then they can tell you, yes, that would be helpful. No, that wouldn't be helpful. Um, so to the extent possible, try and steer clear of that. I'm so sorry, what can I do? And try and actually give, think about how, what are the choices I can give people? And again, that's gonna vary depending on your relationship with the person. Um, I loved that both Scott and Sean talked about this, which is this idea that folks are going to forget. They're going to forget a lot and you're going to have to repeat yourself a lot. And so super helpful to talk about, get that pen and paper, or as Scott said, like you're in the middle of the night and a question comes to you, shoot him off an email. He's not going to respond in the middle of the night, but he's going to respond to you and your question is going to get answered. As I said earlier, Grief impacts your short-term memory. So they're as easy as we can make it for folks, the better. Um, be careful with word choice. We're gonna talk about that in two seconds. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on empathy. All right, <laughs> patronizing statements to avoid people. I promise you, we did not make these up. These are things that people have actually heard um, and said. Um, what I do actually, um, or some variation of this, and oftentimes it's because people feel, you feel frustrated. I don't know how to make you feel better. So I'm going to say something either because I haven't really given it all that much thought or because it is what I think is going to make you feel better. Most people don't say things out of malice. Um, what I will say, I don't know who said it. It might have been... Um, Maya Angelou, said, someone said, um, people won't remember what you said, they'll remember how, how you, it made them feel. This is actually one of the exceptions. People actually will remember what you said. It, particularly at the beginning, particularly if you're law enforcement, because of the power that that role brings, the, the words that you use can and do get kind of seared in people's memory. 
So take that seriously and be mindful of the words and the language that you use. Um, when we had the Navy Yard shooting, I did a bunch of the death notifications at the baseball stadium that night. Um, and the last one I did was uh, with a woman named Yolanda. Her husband was killed. Um, I got to see Yolanda about two years later. Um, she and I met, we were doing, uh, the DC was doing a mass casualty exercise. And one of the things she said to me was, um, Michelle, so the FBI agent actually said the words, um, and what he said was, and he said it just like this, I'm sorry to inform you, your loved one didn't make it. Um, and that haunted her. She felt like he didn't care. She felt like he was just doing a job. She felt like he didn't want to, she was, she was inconveniencing him. Um, and what I actually had the benefit of telling her, this may not be true for everyone, but it was true in this situation, was that agent had never done a death notification before and he hadn't been trained. And he, we, he and I did about four hours of notifications that day and Yolanda was the last one and he was toast. Um, and as he and I walked out of the baseball stadium that night, he said to me, this was one of the worst days of my life. Um, and so it was actually the exact opposite of what Yolanda had experienced. She thought he didn't care because of how flat and unaffected he was. He cared so much it was the only way he was getting through those notifications was to kind of distance himself and have no emotion. There is a balance to be found around um, being compassionate and completely losing it. You don't want to completely lose it, but you want to be compassionate. Um, and so again, it's more art and science, but that haunted her for two years. She, she played that over and over and over in her mind. And it brought her an amazing amount of comfort to know he actually cared deeply um, and just was so overwhelmed by, by what he was having to do that night. Can I add some? Yeah, please. Um, in my experience, there's there's two different things going on, going on there. First and foremost is is your your language that you're using. It has to be very particular. If you make the mistake of telling these people, well, they're no longer with us. The person will turn to you and say, well, where are they now? If you make the mistake of saying they've passed on, they'll turn to you and say, to where to? If you make the mistake of saying, well, you know, this person is in a better place. Oh, okay, where did they go and how can I get there? Don't fall into these traps and it sounds cruel. It sounds harsh, but I do it for a reason. When I come up to someone and I say, after introductions are made, so-and-so was involved in a collision this evening. They did not survive the crash. They are dead. It's final, it's brutal. You rip the Band-Aid off right away and you deal with that, that you, I deal with that trauma that I just created for as long as I need to, but I do it for a reason. The second thing is when you've done a lot of notifications, when you've stood over a lot of dead bodies, you've been dealing with it for, I don't even know how long I've been dealing with it now. For some cases, in particular when it comes to children, there are certain, there are certain, um, like for us, it's traffic homicide investigators that do their best to distance themselves from parents or from loved ones emotionally. And what I mean by that is they come in, they give the notification, and they get the hell out. And the reason why is most of the time because they have children of their own or they realize that if they get too close to this case, they're incurring that emotional trauma themselves. It's real, it builds up, it will weigh on you, and it can kill you. It, I, I don't know how to express that enough that in my career, I've gotten to the point where I have to be very careful with children. 
I've held, too, I've held too many dead children. I've picked them up. I've been around them. I've done it too many times now. And so it's, it's to the point where I'll turn to someone like Scott and I'll say, I need you to do this. I don't need you to do the notification. I just need you to photograph the body, move them around, take some pictures of the tire marks on their chest, whatever it may be. But I have to distance myself from that now because I understand that the way some psychologists will say it, the bucket's full. And if I fill it up anymore, pardon my language, shit will spill out. And there are some investigators that are like that. They're not trying to be distant. They're not trying to be, you know, just harsh with you. It's because they're trying to protect themselves. Um, I've taken the opposite approach with the understanding that there may come a time in my career where I have to walk away. I invest way too much in my, in my criminal cases, and even my non-criminal cases, emotionally. And I stand there with these people and I allow them to give me some of that or to take some of it from them. It's not good, it's not healthy, and it'll end my career. And I understand that. But understand those two things are happening in that moment. They're both very real and they can't be taken lightly. So I understand what the woman is saying, you know, as far as he just said, oh, they're no longer whatever he said. But at the same time, that FBI, that FBI agent or, or whatever he is, <laughs> you incur a lot of trauma when you do that kind of stuff. It's dangerous. Thank you. That was so beautifully and brilliantly said. Um, I actually, we're not going to be able to get to it, but uh, I will send sway of this deck. At the end of this deck is two slides on secondary and vicarious trauma um, because it is real. It, it has incredibly serious effects on your physical and your emotional well-being. Um, and like Sean said, it, you, you let, it gets in, it gets in. You're, you, you, you know, at the WEN Center, I ask my clinicians to spend six or eight hours every day listening to the worst moments of people's lives. It is impossible for it to not get in, um, no matter how long you've been doing it. And so it really is around, how do I, to, again, to Sean's point, how do I empty that bucket a little bit so that shit doesn't start overflowing? Um, because it starts to, it, like imagine a shaken soda can, it's kind of like that. At least it's like that for my clinicians where it starts to spray out in all of the ways that you don't want it to on people that you don't mean it to sort of, and, and you don't have control over it. And that's because you're full. And so it's figure out how do I empty that bucket? How do I wring that sponge um, so that I have space and so that it's not at the detriment long-term at the detriment of my sort of physical, emotional well-being. It trashes relationships. Um, when we don't tend to that stuff, we become emotionally distant because we're trying to protect ourselves, which is very human and very normal, um, except that it also becomes hard to be in a relationship with somebody who's not going to let you in. Um, and so it become, it's really, really important. I, as the executive director of a mental health agency that specializes in this, I would say I spend most, the number Number one is keeping the doors open in my budget. Number two is making sure that my clinicians are okay, as okay as they can be. They have signed up for this. This is their job. But it is my responsibility to also create an environment and avenues so that they have somewhere to empty what they're taking on every single day. Um, helpful responses, and I we we really touched I think on a lot on most of this. Um, I, you know, again, as Sean said, like every single person is different. Every reaction is going to be different, um, and so don't go in thinking, um, okay, well, I know exactly how this person is going to respond. There are some similarities. It falls on gender. It falls on culture falls on religion, it falls on lots of different things that help inform, but the sort of 
the, the depth of the reaction is going to be different. Um, the language used is going to be different. So go in almost like a sort of a clean slate, like, okay, what I know is that I have to tell somebody that their loved one died. After that, we're going to take it from there. Um, the other thing I want to say that's actually not on this slide, but I think is important, is if you hear somebody say, I want to die, that does not mean they're suicidal. Um, I have seen way too many people FD12, that's involuntary hospitalization for 72 hours in DC, um, because they articulated that to a law enforcement officer and that person thought that that meant they were going to kill themselves. They are having a very normal response to the very worst moment of their life. It may be huge, it may be small, um, but it is important for all of us to remember that, you know, we are, for better or worse, the face and voice of the worst moment of someone's life. You know, nobody got into law enforcement because they wanted to be the face and the voice of somebody's worst moment. You all got into law enforcement because you wanted to make the world a better place. And so it takes a piece of you every time you do that. And it's important, again, that we're making sure that you're taken care of. I loved how Sean said, you know, sometimes I have to tap out and ask Scott, you know, can you do the photograph? Because I just, I can't do it. I've seen too many. And that is super important, being able to use each other um, so that you can be in this for the long haul, so that you can stay present and compassionate and caring and all of the reasons you got into law enforcement in the first place. All right, with that, I am going to stop um, and I am going to open it up for questions. So Sway, I'm gonna look to you. Great, thank you Michelle and everyone for um, the information today. If anyone has any questions at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A box. Please type in the questions um, and we'll provide them to either Michelle, Moore, Scott or Sean. If you have any specific questions throughout the webinar that came about that you want to ask them right now would be a great time to ask. We'll give attendees a couple of minutes to type in questions if there are any. If you have any comments as well, that would be great. Um, if some of you all are leaving, please, um, we will follow up with the email with the link to a survey and the PowerPoint and the link to the webinar today. Um, someone asked Michelle, does the Went Center to teletherapy? You're on mute. Yes, we do teletherapy. In fact, right now that's the only therapy that we're doing um, because of COVID. Um, and I will say as the executive director, I went kicking and screaming into teletherapy. I didn't think it was a good idea for uh, traumatized or grieving people. And I am so thrilled to say I have been proven wrong. Um, our clients seem to, uh, be, you know, we're checking in constantly and we're getting feedback that they feel like it's as effective as if, as effective as if they were in the room with their clinician and it's easier, it's more accessible for them. They don't have to go somewhere. Um, I don't know about you guys, but DC has horrendous traffic. And so trying to get to an office is like more than a notion. Um, and so it makes it a lot easier for folks if they can just bring it up on their phone or on a computer. Great. We have another question. <clears throat> is there a best practice for a death notification team, meaning officer, advocate, chaplain? So ideally it is an officer and an advocate or an officer and a chaplain. Um, that is not always possible, but yes, that is sort of, you know, in, in a world where you have all the time in the world to plan and all of the money and all of the resources and people waiting, that is considered the ideal, is a law enforcement officer and either an advocate or a chaplain. Awesome. Um, another question was asked was, this was great. Thank you very much for the information. Greg therapy is, I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Great therapy is very hard and specialized niche. Can we further training? How can I get in touch with someone for further training? Um, these trainings are provided through the Complex Homicide Program. 
Um, if you like other further trainings as far as other type of different therapies, um, we wouldn't be able to provide that, but you could definitely reach out to us through the ncvctta.org website, um, which we will also include in the email, and we can see if we can connect you to a possible training, unless Michelle knows of anyone. Yeah, I was just gonna say, so the One Center has a training institute um, where uh, we do probably in the ballpark of 20 to 22 different trainings related to grief, trauma, kids, grown-ups. Um, again, all of this is at the moment done virtually. And we will at some point go back to providing both online trainings as well as in-person trainings. So for folks on the call who do live in the DC or near the DC metro area, um, you will be able to attend in-person trainings again in September. Um, in the meanwhile, um, we offer webinars. If you go to our website, which is www.went, it's W-E-N as in Nancy, D as in David, T as in Tom, center.org, you'll see um, a training institute tab. If you click on that, you'll be able to see all of our trainings. Awesome. Um, is there any ongoing conversation with social media platforms about rejecting or screening out crime scene and crash photos? If so, how can we help? Sure. Uh, that's a good question. And that's <laughs> not, I know Facebook was trying to do something, um, but don't know how successful they, in fact, I don't think they've been successful. And actually, I think most of this is coming through um, Instagram. Do either, do any of you guys know? No, not at all. I wish people would just use judgment. Like, how would you feel? <laughs> um, do, uh, Michelle, can you, um, after this, can you email me the website to your training institute for the Red Center that's to send an email to everyone? Yeah. Um, they want to get the website. So, uh, Natalie, we will send that out in a follow-up email. Hey, Hostway. Yes. Um, if, when you send out the survivor resource booklet, you may even want to include our um, point card for law enforcement for the um, death notification process, just in case it'll assist another agency. So it's a work product through the grant. Cool. I'll send that over to Megan. Everyone, you'll receive an email from Megan about with those documents as well. Thank you. And I typed the Went Center Training Institute webpage in the chat box. If you guys uh, want to click there, you'll be able to link right to it. And we have a shout out to Scott and Sean. Thank you to the law enforcement team for keeping us safe and being supportive. I do want to give a round of applause to Scott and Sean. Thank you for making time out of your day today. As you can tell, they are still working. They're in their cars. <laughs> um, but I do appreciate the time you gave out today to provide feedback in your personal um, history when providing that notification, what you've all been through. And thank you for that as well. Thank you for having us. All right, is there any other more questions or comments? Give it a minute. Great. So with that being said, I think we can end it now. Thank you all for joining. Again, you will all receive a, a link to a survey. Please fill it out, it would be great, as well as the PowerPoint and the link to the webinar and the two documents mentioned, the survivor resource packet and the point card from Palm Beach County. Um, and also please follow up with, the, with us if you all have any questions. And thank you for attending today's webinar. Bye everyone.